This is Matthew Cratter from Trader University, and today I want to talk about why I am an extremely bullish bear. If you're interested in learning how the economy actually works, what's actually going on in the market, so you can make money in both bull and bear markets, be sure to hit that subscribe button. So a lot of people who are new to my channel seem to uh, seem to think that I'm sort of a naive bull. And I just wanted to address this because what we are seeing happening now in the, in the world economy and in the US and in the financial markets is like nothing else that anyone has ever seen in their lifetime. This was last seen probably, I would say, in the, uh, in the 1930s. And so I wanna talk about why I'm massively bullish on the stock market and why I'm very bearish as well. I love this, uh, this meme, bull markets make you money, but bear markets make you rich. I think this uh, bull bear market can make people very wealthy, but only if they understand exactly what's going on. So I understand what's going on in the world. I often get YouTube comments saying, don't you realize that the market's overvalued, that there's a pandemic, that people are drowning in, in debt, governments are drowning in debt, uh, corporations are drowning in debt, restaurants are closing, the government's gonna need to bail out everyone, there's wealth inequality, there's class warfare rioting in the streets. The November election is coming, which is sure to be quite contentious no matter who wins. Uh, a lot of social upheaval, rise in nationalism, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. I understand all this, and I am, I guess I am a bear because I agree that all of this is very real. And yet, I think that stocks, gold, real estate, Bitcoin, scarce assets are going to go up a lot, and that valuation doesn't matter anymore. I'm going to show you why, uh, the reasons for that. So people often compare the current period of time to the late 90s, which I lived through and traded through. You can see the melt up in the NASDAQ here. This is when the NASDAQ basically went from around uh, 2000 in early 1999 and went all the way above 5000 in just the space of uh, less than a year and a half. And we really had a melt up during this sort of traditionally bullish period in the fall of 1999. Of course, we had a very big crash and a uh, two-year bull, uh, two-year bear market after the peak of this, but this was a very different time. Gold at this point was in a very deep bear market. It had basically been going down since the uh, the late 1970s, early 1980s peaks, and uh, we can see that really that whole time that the stock market was going up, the tech stocks were going up, the blue chips were going up, gold was going down. We see a little bit of a spike in gold here. Uh, you'll probably ask me what that is. This is the summer of uh, 1999. Basically, what had been happening for, for uh, a couple years is that the, uh, the UK had been selling all of its gold reserves. This is often known, it's got the humorous name as Brown's Bottom or the Brown Bottom. Uh, Gordon Brown was dumping gold at the, uh, at the point at which gold was at its lowest price for 20 years. One of the biggest idiots of all time. You can imagine how long it took England to accumulate this gold, maybe a thousand years. And here he was selling it because he thought it was the dirty yellow metal. Then what happened in, uh, in, 2000, in uh, 1999 is that there was an agreement to, uh, to limit the sales of gold. This was an agreement between, uh, it's called the Washington Agreement on Gold, it was signed on September 26th, and it's between uh, the European countries and the, uh, and the US. And so that's why we see the spike in gold. Uh, nevertheless, gold, even as the bear market took off, gold continued to go lower finally making some uh, some decade lows. And so that's that was the period to summarize melt up in stocks, very high PEs, and also a bear market in gold. Now it's very different today. We have a similar similar melt up. We had a little bit of an interruption obviously but be uh, because of the COVID crisis, but even in spite of this, in spite of the fact that there's so many people out of work and so many people suffering, uh, the Nasdaq especially uh, new economy stocks, tech stocks are hitting new all-time highs, and they, they bounce back fairly quickly. Uh, even I was surprised by this, and this is one of the reasons behind my thesis, why are stocks so strong when things are so bad? But if we didn't have COVID, you could have seen this just uh, no interruption whatsoever. But the strange thing, and what makes me very suspect of this rally, and when I say suspect, it's not that I don't think it's gonna continue, I think it's gonna continue, it's actually gonna accelerate as people figure this out. But the, the weird thing about this is gold is in a bull market at the same time. And gold is actually melting up as we speak. People are figuring out gold. If you've been watching this channel, we've been talking about it for probably probably a year. But this is a really weird environment where gold is doing well. At the same time, 
that tech stocks and stocks are doing well. And what this implies is that there's actually a currency devaluation underway. The US dollar is being devalued, not necessarily against other uh, fiat currencies like the euro and the yen. There has been some of that devaluation, though we're sort of in a trading range. But what's happening is that all the fiat currencies are being devalued against real assets like gold, like houses, and uh, things like Bitcoin as well. And what happens when a currency goes down is you can often get a very sharp rise in stocks. What a lot of people don't know is that in Venezuela, in Zimbabwe, and failed countries like this, we've, we've had over the last few years huge stock market rallies where the stock market can go up 2,000% in a year. And it's not that uh, stocks are doing that well, it's just that the underlying currency is being devalued. And so in that currency, stocks rise. And I think we're seeing something similar. Obviously, the US is not Venezuela or Zimbabwe. It's a much more developed country. Uh, we have a better infrastructure. We have a better rule of law, etc. But we also happen to have the world reserve currency, the US dollar. And what we're seeing right now is the end of the US dollar. Now, it's probably going to take another, uh, I would say, 20 to 40 years to really, to really disappear. But what's happening is we're seeing giant strains on the U.S. on the global financial uh, system, and this is this is one this is the reason behind the melt up in stocks, and this is why I'm very uh, bullish on stocks, even though I recognize that uh, everything's going wrong. Here's a comparison of uh, that 1999-2000 period. This is the federal. Uh, it's usually called the federal deficit because the government usually spends more than it brings in in taxes. But we can see for a brief period in the late 90s. We did have a budget surplus, um, which uh, which we'll probably never see again. This is where the government is actually collecting more in taxes than it's spending, and this was really driven by uh, the end of the Cold War. The end of the Cold War, the U.S. was able to really scale back military spending, and also there were huge capital gains um, in the stock market, and so people were paying a lot of capital gains tax. That's probably the best way to explain this. Also, the uh, baby baby boomer generation hadn't really begun to retire, and so the, the spending on Social Security and Medicare and the entitlement spending was much lower. And so this period where gold is going down, stocks are going up, is, is a period of, of a fairly healthy uh, government where it's actually living within its, within its means. By contrast, we now have trillion dollar deficits. And what this means we can see here that the government is uh, bringing in about 2.3 trillion in taxes, spending roughly, depending on whose number you use, and uh, this may be tra trailing 12 months, spending about 5 trillion. If you use the actual number here, it's 6 trillion. Either way, we have a federal budget deficit, which means we're spending more than we're bringing in in taxes, of 2.8 or 3.7 trillion. So we've really flipped over this 25-year uh, period, 21-year 20, period, from a budget surplus to a budget deficit. And who is, uh, who is picking up the tab? Well, basically, when you have, when you're, when you're a government and you're spending more than you're bringing in, you need to issue bonds. The U.S. government issues something called U.S. Treasury bonds. These are backed by the, uh, backed by the U.S. government and they can always print money to pay them back, so they're quote unquote very safe. But what's happening right now is that Congress is spending so much money that uh, they're spending more money than they're bringing in, in than the Treasury's bringing in in taxes. And so the U.S. has to issue a lot of debt, but there are no marginal buyers left for this debt. And now this is why the Fed, really since late last year, has been the biggest buyer of U.S. Treasuries. And now the Fed, which is the U.S. Central Bank, the Federal Reserve, now owns more U.S. Treasuries than uh, than foreign investors or domestic investors. We can see this this huge spike here, and uh, this is this is what's really driving everything. The Fed is expanding their balance sheet, and how do they do this? Well, they do this by printing money. They actually print money digitally. They print it out of nowhere, and they use it to buy Treasuries. They buy U.S. Treasuries. And then the uh, they buy treasuries, and then uh, the money goes to the U.S. to the U.S. Treasury, and then it goes to Congress, and it gets it gets spent in the real economy. Uh, and it was behind those six hundred dollar checks that got sent out sent out earlier this year. But basically, you have a situation where the Fed is monetizing 
government debt by printing more money. And when you print more of something, when you create more of something, the value of it is worth less. And so we can see right here, the, this is the, uh, the M2 money stock, this is the money supply. Back in uh, late 1999, 2000, you can see the slope of the line. The money supply always expands over time, in, uh, in, in the US at least. Uh, the slope was fairly flat, but what's happened uh, really in the last quarter, or the last six months, is that it has gone vertical. I'll, uh, I'll uh, zoom in here so you can see. We've basically gone from about a 15.2 uh, trillion money supply above uh, almost 18, uh, 18.5 trillion. So a huge spike in the money supply. And this is the money that the Fed is using that's creating out of nowhere to use to buy treasuries. So basically the Fed, our central bank, is funding these giant these giant budget deficits that the U.S. government is running. The Fed is paying for them with funny money that it creates out of nowhere. And this decreases the purchasing power of the U.S. dollar. Whether it shows up as C CPI inflation or not doesn't really matter. We can see gold moving up massively. We know the purchasing power of the U.S. dollar is going down over time. And so we're really at this end game where if we go back and look at the two-year treasury, this is the two-year government bond, it was around 6% during that last melt up in the late 1990s. So there was still a lot of room to cut interest rates. This was the play that the central bank always did whenever there was a recession. They would cut interest rates, but you can see each peak in interest rates, rates the peak in uh, 2006, 2007, the peak in uh, 2018, I think it was, uh, each peak is lower. And now we're at the, we're sort of at the zero bound. The US Treasury, the uh, two-year Treasury, instead of paying 6%, currently is it's basically at zero it pays 0.16 percent that's not 1.6 percent but 0.16 that's 16 basis points and so we are at this point where we're really at the beginning of the end of the current financial system uh, which runs basically on the u.s dollar and how do we know that we know that because interest rates risk-free interest rates on treasuries are basically at zero i think the 30 year is something like one percent but all the close interest rates are extremely low and they're they're well below the targeted 2% inflation rate. And so the calculation, the basic calculation is, why would you hold a fiat currency like the US dollar if you're earning basically 0% on it risk-free at the same time that a lot more of it is being created? And this is what institutional investors and smart retail investors are waking up to. That if you're gonna hold, hold something that yields 0%, you might as well hold a much more fundamental form of money like gold or Bitcoin, possibly silver. And uh, if you want to hold sort of money in its base layer, if you want to earn some sort of interest, you're much better off maybe buying the S&P and getting a one and a half, two percent uh, dividend yield or buying corporate bonds or something like this. But this is really the, 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 the end point of a currency where interest rates go to zero and the central bank starts printing huge amounts of funny money to fund government spending. People call uh, Bitcoin the, the magic internet money, but it's really the US dollar that is the magic money. It has infinite supply, and that's a good thing, or potentially infinite supply, because taxes will never again cover government expenditures in the US, simply because of all the promises made to retiring generations, all the social security and the Medicare, in addition to all the wars we're probably gonna have to fight it looks like the U.S. wants to get into a, a war again, either with Russia or China or something terrible like that. And so uh, basically governments never shrink. The U.S. government, if anything, is expanded during the COVID crisis, perhaps justifiably. There are a lot of people in need, but unfortunately, all of this needs to be paid for with funny money, which will continue to devalue the U.S. dollar, not necessarily against other fiat currencies. Maybe it stays strong against the euro and the yen, but certainly against real assets like scarce real estate, quality real estate, gold, Bitcoin, etc. And this is there's not really a political solution to this. If, uh, if you think that we could just uh, raise taxes, we could basically confiscate 100% of the net worth, 100% of the wealth of all U.S. billionaires, and it would only get us maybe 10% of the way there. So if the U.S. owes roughly 100 trillion when you count entitlement spending, I think U.S. billionaire net worth is something like 10 trillion if you add it all up. You could basically uh, take all their money as they did during the French Revolution, cut off their heads and use that and it's still, it would just pay for a tenth of it. So this, this is a much more fundamental problem. And uh, 
it's actually this the 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 uh, central bank policy of printing money and buying bonds with it what we call quantitative easing i've talked about in other videos that has really contributed to a lot of the resentment a lot of the social uh upheavals simply because it exacerbates wealth inequality it causes wealth inequality when you print money and buy assets with it as the fed's doing it makes real estate go up it makes stocks go up and as a result it leads to more and more wealth inequality which leads to more populism it leads to riots in the street and it leads to ultimately political revolution or uh, or violence and so that's the situation we're in right now this is why i'm very bullish on the stock market not because i think everything is fine and that uh, things are being run well but because we're at the point of no return there's nothing the fed or the federal government or the central bank can do at this point they're basically like a drunk driver being ch chased by the police going 100 miles per hour they can never let up on the gas again and they're eventually going to end up by hitting a brick wall we don't know exactly the form that this is going to take but what i would suggest is over the next uh the next coming years stocks could go up an enormous amount they could go up they could double from here they could go up 5x they could go up 10x they could go up 100x because what's happening is the currency that they're that they are being valued in the U.S. dollar can go down a lot. It can go down. Uh, it can go down almost 100 percent. It can go down 99.99, etc. percent. And so I think this is really what's behind the stock market rally. Obviously, there's a lot of new technology. There are good things happening. There are huge productivity gains, but even those have the tendency to put people out of work. When we have robots and AI running everything, we're really going to need to spend. Uh, uh, the government, you know, won't won't want this to happen. Uh, won't want people to be unemployed because then they start causing problems. And so there'll, there'll be UBI, there'll be checks in the mail, et cetera, that will be paid for by more central bank printing. So this is why if you are bearish on the economy, if you say there are problems, I think you have it completely backwards. We are seeing a situation now that hasn't been seen in the developed world in 70 or 80 years. We're at the end of the 80-year debt cycle, long-term debt cycle, as Ray Dalio has been pointing out for a few years. And I think it's really here now. And as a result, I'm expecting a massive up melt up, uh, melt up in stocks, in gold, which will continue, and in Bitcoin. Bitcoin's currently at about $9,500 per Bitcoin. Uh, I think it's on its way easily to a million, probably to about 200,000 in the next year or two. So if you're going to be bearish, if you're going to be shorting things, I think you're going to get run over, uh, run over by this truck. I think it's a one way. It's obviously there'll be pullbacks. This isn't to say that the stock market can't pull back 10% this summer or something like that, but pullbacks will be sh more and more shallow. We'll never again have a 50% bull market, 50% uh, bear market drawdown as we did in 2000 to 2002 or 2007 to 2009. The Fed will not tolerate it. We'll have the same thing happen that happened in early 2020 in March, where the Fed basically says they're going to buy everything. They're going to buy junk bonds. They're going to buy munis. They're going to uh, insure the stock market and ensure that it goes higher. So this is why I am an extremely bullish bear. I'm a bear, but I think asset prices, scarce asset prices are going much, much higher. Stocks probably just keep pace or barely keep up uh, if, if we're lucky with the devaluation of the dollar. But gold and Bitcoin and uh, probably real estate as well uh, will, will be a way of preserving wealth and actually increasing wealth. And so I think if you want to increase your wealth, you need to be in gold and Bitcoin. Those are the two places. And I think Bitcoin will have much, much higher upside than gold. Again, not investment advice, just how I am positioned. And I'm also um, uh, think that we're going to see a lot of good momentum trading here, a lot of good momentum stocks. And we're going to see very similar craziness to what was seen in the late 90s. You're going to hear a lot of comparisons. You're going to hear that we're in a bubble, etc. But as I hope uh, I've demonstrated in this video, we're in a completely different situation where gold is gold is rallying along with stocks and the U.S. dollar is being devalued and we're rapidly approaching the end of the current financial system. Please hit that subscribe button and the like button if you found this video helpful. Let me know your questions and comments in the comment section below. I know some of what I've said here is probably going to be pretty controversial. Let me know what you're thinking or if you have questions. And thanks a lot for watching. I'll see you in the next video.